In this recording, we are going to be going through the lines 847 through 899, maybe I'll split it into I do not know, of book six of the Aeneid. And starting in 847, as you can see, we jump from 476 in the last meeting of Dido to 847. We jump right into the conversation that Aeneas is having with his father Anchises. Remember the whole reason why he's going down to the underworld to begin with is to get that pep talk from him as Anchises had instructed. And so here, as you can see the quotation, these are Anchises' words. Excudent alia sperantium molius aira credo equidem. Other guys, i.e. not Romans. These are the Greeks that we will be talking about. The other guys. They will cut out kudo kudere. That is an E in a third conjugation, so it means to cut out X. And they will cut out bronzes. Aira. Aira comes from ice, iris, and it is where they get the Roman coin, the Oz, because it was made out of bronze. But here, of course, we are talking about the bronze statuary that the Greeks had made. If ever you see an ancient statue and it's made out of marble, it is a Roman copy of a Greek statue. And that's what they, of course, used as their medium. So other guys will cut out bronzes. Breathing, present active participle, from spiro spirare, more softly. A mollusk is so called a mollusk because of its soft body, and so IUS makes it the comparative. And he goes on to say, indeed, I believe it. In other words, no, 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 really, they will. Other people will be better at being sculptors. And these other people, of course, are the Greeks. And again, you see the E of the third conjugation, ducos ducere. They will lead, and they will lead faces. Accusative plural, vultus vultus is your visage, your countenance. Living faces from the marble. The statuary that they do make in marble, the faces when you see them, they obviously are living faces. We both modifying vultus. They will lead them out, in other words, cut them out. They will plead, ora orare. And it's future, because you see the B.I. Bobis bit, bibis bit is bunt. Their cases, these are like court cases. And they will do so better. In other words, they're going to be better lawyers. They're going to be better attorneys. They're going to be better public speakers. The Romans had Cicero, but the Greeks had Demosthenes. Demosthenes is the god of all orators of the ancient world. The Greeks are just better at these things. And, que. They will write, scribo, scribere, that long he tells me from third conjugation in his future, they will write out the meanderings, the movements of the genitive sky, which of course are the stars as they go across, radio. This is an astronomical instrument with an astronomical instrument. They will be better astronomers, scientists, and they will say another future, dico dicere with a third eye, the rising stars. They will chart it all out. So they're going to be better artists, they're going to be better orators slash lawyers, and they're going to be better astronomers, they're better scientists. These are the things that the Greeks are better at. If I were to reduce all of Greek civilization to one word, it would be that they are about art, and that is what they have gifted Western civilization to. But then, he is talking to Aeneas. And he tells to him, you, and look what he calls Aeneas, Roman. Because he is talking more than just to Aeneas. He is talking to all of the people who are hearing this, being sung in the streets of Rome. The generic Roman. Aeneas as the proto-Roman, although he will not found Rome. But he is the proto-Roman. You, Roman, memento. Now, this is the defective verb that we have seen before. And it is maimony, maimonise. But when you have it as a command, you make it into a future imperative, which, remember, has the toe and the tote. Remember, this is what you do, he is saying. So you, Roman, as a command, remember to rule the peoples with empire, with power, if you would like. The job of the Roman, the essence of the Roman, is not what the Greek is, which is art slash skill. The soul of the Roman is to govern. 
People always think of the Romans as being conquerors. They are not conquerors. Conquering is only the byproduct to get to what the Roman soul is about, and that is of governance. Remember to rule the peoples with power. These, he high height, will be, and you can see on the right hand side, will be the artes, the skills for you. The governance for the Romans is their art, whereas the art for the Greeks is art itself. These will be the skills for you. And, memento again, remember to place custom. We've seen this now before. Mus moris. And to place custom for the peace. The Romans are not about warring. They're about the peace because peace allows them to govern more. And so it's making it the custom, as it were. Memento, remember to spare parco parcade. Parco parcade peperci, parcitus, takes a dative object. To spare the subjected. In other words, you are not to put those that you conquer under your thumb and crush them. Instead, what you are to do is welcome them into the fold of the Roman Empire. Make them feel welcome as a part of the Roman Empire. I heard one person one time say, that had the colonies of the United States been the colonies of the Roman Empire, we would still be Romans. We would not have become our own country. It is about inclusivity into the greatness of the empire. And remember to tear down in war, bellare, the superbos, the proud. And so in these lines, you get the essence of what it means to be a Roman. I would imagine that a Roman out in the streets hearing these lines sung for the first time would have had chill bumps as their whole essence of the civilization is boiled down as to what they are all about and comparing to what they are not all about as a nod to the influence of that, of course, civilization. Thus, Father Anchises spoke. And he adds, added these things, for the ones marveling. Miror, mirari, miratisu means to be amazed. And so he then says, aspike, look, check it out. It is a command, aspiko, aspikere, we drop the R-E. Now, ut almost always, whenever there is no subjunctive, and there is not, I'm about to scroll and you will see. But in this instance, it is going to be introducing an indirect question that essentially means how. So look, how, yeah, my screen went out, they can't even see, they're not there though, are they? Probably not. They would have said something. I just want to ruin the video. No, don't ruin the video. It's perfectly fine. Let me know. I don't mind. There's something in the chat. So no. Oh, yeah, I don't read that. That thing is not being read by me at all. Oh, yeah, there you go. I appreciate it. Thank you for letting me know. Look how Marcellus. And we had this word previously. Insignis, insignis, insignia. It means marked with the spolia opima. Now, there are several things that you can gain by military glory as an individual soldier. There is something called the Corona Cubica. There is a thing called the Corona Gramenea. A whole variety of things. But the greatest award, kind of the equivalency of the United States, the greatest award that a soldier can win in battle is the Congressional Medal of Honor. Very few people win it, and most of the people who earn it do so after they are dead, because the death was the thing that was the bravery that obviously allowed them to earn it. But in the previous lines, we saw the thing that is known as the spolia opima. To earn the spolia opima, you had to have on the battlefield, as the general of the army fighting, one-on-one -on -one combat against the general of the other army, and you had to kill him in one-on-one -on -one combat. It was earned only three times in all of Roman history. The first time it was earned by the king of Rome named Romulus. The second time it was earned by a fellow by the name of Cosus. And the third time it was earned by this fellow by the name of Marcellus. Now we're going to have two Marcelli here. This Marcellus is the Marcellus of the Second Punic War. But before fighting in the Second Punic War, and he was the great hero of the Second Punic War, was Marcellus for recapturing Sicily from the side of the Romans. This Marcellus had defeated a Gallic fellow, a Gaul by the name of Vera de Morris, and had won the Spolia Opima. So it would be seen is that in the underworld there are all of these Romans, not only who have died, 
Well, there can't be any in the one that has died because Rome doesn't exist as of yet, but all the Romans that will be one day, and Marcellus is one. And why is Marcellus a guy that definitely he is going to make sure Anchises needs to point out? Because he's one of the greatest Romans ever to live. Only three of these guys ever won the Spolia Opima. Check out how, remember, Aspice Ut, Marcellus, marked with the Spolia Opima, he goes, gradi or gradi, gressusum, and as a victor, he surpasses, he is preeminent, all men. He surpasses them all. He's like the greatest that the Romans are going to have to offer. He won the Spoli Opima. This guy, meaning Marcellus, as an equestrian, he will lay low. You can just set it down. You can just set it down. Thank you. He, right, not lay low. I said lay low. That's what comes up next. I was distracted. He will set up, Sisto Sistere, the Roman Republic. What this means is that he will provide stability for the whole of the Roman Republic. He will set it up with a great hubbub raging. So he's going to bring a time of stability. And he's sterno sternere. That's the one that's lay low. And he will lay low the Phoenicians in the Second Punic War and the Gallic rebel. That Gallic rebel is Viridomaris the man whom he had defeated to earn the Spolia Opima. And he will, because it is suspendo, suspendere, hang up the third weapons, the third set of weapons, having been captured for Father Quirinus, who was, of course, the founder of Rome, Romulus. And so he's got the first set of Spolia Opima, the second set, and the third set, which is, of course, Marcellus. And so this is like the guy that we would look to. It would be kind of like the George Washington, if we look at George Washington as maybe one of our greatest presidents, or Lincoln, or something like that. A great heroic figure from World War II would be Audie Murphy, maybe. Audie Murphy was the most decorated American soldier in all of World War II. He then parlayed that success into a film career after World War II. But, and here, Aeneas does something. And that something is, quote, ask a question. So, and here Aeneas says, but then we have all of this in parentheses. For, nam que, he saw that a young man in the accusative. And thus, if we have an accusative subject, we'll have an infinitive verb, ire. He saw that a young man. And then we get, of course, an adjective to describe this young man. Egregious, outstanding. Ablative of specification. Outstanding in one way, in his form. He's good looking. So he saw that a young man, outstanding in his form, was going together. So with this magnificent Marcellus, this man who was won the Spolia Opima, there's a young man with him. But not only outstanding in his form, but outstanding also in his gleaming arms, gleaming weapons. He is refulgent. But his frowns, his face, his forehead, parum lita. Parum means not at all. It is a super negative, not just a regular negative. Another word in Latin that you don't see in the lines of the AP syllabus, but nevertheless it exists quite a bit, is howled. It means not at all. But his face, not at all happy. And his lumina, his lights, which are his eyes, with a dejected appearance, face, countenance, if you would like. We just had it a second ago. And so we've got magnificent Marcellus, then we got a young guy who looks really good, but apparently is really, really bummed out. And so naturally what Aeneas asks is, who is that guy? Dad. That guy who thus, in such a way, accompanies comitor comitare, the man going. Aeontim is from eo, ire, ii, and the present active participle would be eanes, eanes, eanes in the nominative, but then for all of the others, it'd be aeontis in the genitive, aeonti, aeontim, and that's exactly what we have there. The one going. So he wants to know, who's that other guy with him? The guy that looks so awesome but seems a little bit depressed. And he makes a suggestion as to whom he might think it would be. Is it Aphilius? Is it Marcellus' son? Ane. Or, that's what an means, and that ne makes it a question. Or, 
somebody, aliquis aliquid means someone or somebody, is a somebody from the great stock of grandsons that nepotin comes from. Nepos, nepotis, that's where we get the word nepotism. And stock, it means like the trunk of the family tree. So, or on somebody from the great trunk of grandsons. It's got to be somebody related to Marcellus. Qui strepitus kirka comitum. What uproar of companions. Uh, we see this word so often. Comes is the nominative. Comitis is the genitive. Of companions all around. He's got all these people with him. His posse, his coterie. And how much an instar, a presence, a majesty is what an instar is in himself. He just, I can took it, he's got an aura about him. He looks awesome. Who is this young guy with the great Marcellus who wants to fully open him up? But dark night flies around his head with sad shadow. There's a certain gloom about him. Then Father Anchises. Having gone in, ingredio, ingredi, ingressusum, with tears having arisen. Both of these are deponents, so they are perfect passive looking participles from the verb orior, oriri, or to sum, with tears having arisen. Oh, mate. Oh, masculine thing having been born. Well, that would be, of course, son. Oh, son. Oh, masculine thing having been created. Me quire. Now, this is again where we have seen it before that the Virgil is going to break the rules of Latin. Negative imperative is noli or nolite plus an infinitive. But what he has done is he has just taken an imperative because the verb is quire, taken off the re, and then put a negative with it. Do not ask about quiror, quirere, qui siwi, qui cetus. That's where we get the word question. Don't ask about. The huge grief of yours. So in other words, don't even ask about this guy. We're too sad to even think about it. The fata. The fates will show, because it's ostenda ostendere, third conjugation with an E, this so great guy to the lands. In other words, he will be born. He will live. And the fates will not allow. And again, it's sino sinere, si we situs. We learned this verb in Ecce Romani during the chapters about the drinking party, Comissatio, that Cornelius will not allow them to drink too much of the wine. So the fates will show this so great guy to the lands, to the earth, and will not allow him to be ultra anymore, i.e., he is going to die young. Now, I will go ahead and explain who this young man is at this time. This young man is Marcellus. But not the Marcellus, the one that's fully an opium on. This is the Marcellus that is the nephew of Augustus. Augustus never had a child of his own. Instead, when he... Well, he did have a child, but the child that he had of his own was his daughter, Julia. And he divorced Julia's mother, Scribonia, and married another gal by the name of Livia. And Livia brought into the marriage two sons of her own from her previous marriage, a fellow by the name of Tiberius and a fellow by the name of Drusus. Augustus didn't much care for him, but they were all right. However, Augustus's sister... Octavia had married a fellow by the name of Claudius Marcellus, and that's why this whole big family, if I were to draw the whole imagery, tree, would be known as the Julio-Claudians. You have the Julian part, and you have the Claudian part on both sides. Livia's uh, previous husband, which she had those two children with, was a Claudian, and Octavia had a child with Claudian, and that child was Marcellus. Now, to explain how Marcellus, or the effect that Marcellus had on the people of Rome, would be impossible for me. Marcellus was looked at by the Romans as being the guy that is going to succeed his uncle and lead Rome into a glory age. He was young. 
He was handsome. He was magnificent. And he was married to Augustus' daughter by Augustus, sealing this expectation that when Augustus passes on, it is Marcellus who will then step into his spot. Marcellus, unfortunately, historically, tragically, never lived to see his 20s. He died of fever. Some sort of an illness took him away. All of Rome was devastated. It would be the equivalency of JFK and Abraham Lincoln's death all into one. One of the reasons why JFK's death struck the United States as hard as it did is that he was young and promising, and his wife was young and beautiful, and they were just taken away. It was absolutely just crushing for the country, whether you agreed with his policies and politics or not. And as a matter of fact, it is said, and I think you have a picture in your book of it, that as Virgil was composing these lines, from time to time, Augustus would invite Virgil to come to the royal palace and, hey, why don't you just perform for us some of the lines that you're currently working on? And as he started singing these lines, it just happened to be that Octavia was there. And he was composing these lines, obviously, after the death of the young, magnificent Marcellus. And as he sung these lines, describing her son, she is said to have passed out from the overwhelming grief that obviously it engendered within her. And so, this is what he is describing. The Roman propagation, the propagation would be the Roman-like offspring, would have. Now the reason being is that with Wisa is an expectation that this would be a fuiset, which would be here in the Protasis, they start out with the then clause, and then you move on to the if clause. So I guess we can switch it around. If these gifts, and by these gifts we mean like uh, Marcellus being alive and growing up into full manhood. If these gifts had been, they weren't. If these gifts had been everlasting, propria, one's own property forever, O oh, gods above, he is directly talking to the gods in the vocative, is in Kaisis. O oh, gods above, if these gifts had been forever, then the Roman people, the Roman offspring, would have seen nimium potens, too much powerful. So what Anchises is suggesting is that the gods swept him away tragically, because had he been able to grow up into full manhood, the Romans would have been just too powerful because of the great leader that Marcellus would have and is destined to be. That guy, meaning Marcellus, he, no, no, not Marcellus, ah, there it is, it's modifying compass, that field of Mars. The field of Mars is the location of a couple of things. Now the Tiber River, as it comes through, it looks like this right here, and then there's a bend, and it goes like that. And over here is known as the Campus Martius. And in the Campus Martius is where they did the voting, and previously, in the early days of Rome, was where they did, of course, all of their military exercises. But right here to the north of the Campus Martius is the tomb of Augustus, the mausoleum of Augustus. It's one of two great mausolea that are in the city of Rome. The other is over here, and that is the one of Hadrian. And so that's why we are now talking about it, because in Marcellus's funeral procession, I'm going to go right in this direction, up there, through that way. That field of Mars will drive ago agere, quantos gametus, how great a groans of men, to the great city. So in that all of Rome, obviously, is yelling in grief, yelling in their misery upon his death, wailing, if you would like. Or, that's what well means, what funerals you will see Tiber River. And why would the Tiber River see it? Because it's right by where the funeral procession would be. So now talking directly to the Tiber River. What funerals you will see when, and this is your alternate ending. That really ray is really the ending ris. And so that long E tells us future from our verb, third conjugation, labor labi, it's a deponent when you will glide past the recent tomb. Now, the mausoleum had been there quite a while, but why is it a recent tomb? Because there's a recent burial in it. 
And so he is describing, obviously, the great possibility of Marcellus, but at the same time highlighting the fact that he was obviously swept away at a rather early age. Nevertheless, not any boy from the Trojan race, because remember, this is how then the Romans themselves can trace their lineage back through the Trojans. Not any boy from the Trojan race will lift up Tolo Tolere Sistili Sublatus, the Latin grandfathers, that's what the Avus is, so much in their hope. So in other words, the older generations looked at Marcellus and thought, this is the guy. Kind of like David and Solomon. David couldn't build the temple. He had too much blood on his hands. But Solomon, Solomon can do it. There's so much hope in Solomon. Because the father, David, he's got, he's got problems. He's got blood on his hands. He's fought too many wars. He's killed too many people. He killed poor Uriah the Hittite. But Solomon, now there's a guy that doesn't have the baggage, necessarily. And so that's what's described here. Augustus has too much of the baggage. What's that? Why is he viewed like that? Is Mark? it just his lineage? Well, no, it's because he was really that awesome, so young. From the moment that he was born, he was being groomed to become this leader. And it's always more tragic when they are young and ripped away. So, no any boy from the Trojan race will lift up the Latin grandfather so much in their hope. Nor Will the Romulan land, Tellus Telluris, a third declension word that means earth or land, nor will the Romulan land throw about itself, to throw itself about would be to brag, so much one day, once upon a time, for any offspring. So in other words, he is the guy. And being the guy, it brings with it a lot of expectation. Alas! The piety. Again, remember, the Aeneas is Mr. Pietas, but so is apparently Marcellus, the nephew. Alas, the Prisca Fides, the pristine faith. And, alas, the right hand, unconquered in war. He truly was. Pardon the interruption, do you have Hannah Gaston? I do not. Okay, she's just not here today? No. Thank you. Okay. Non illi se quisquam impune tu licet, obvious armato, se cum peres ieret in hostem, se spumantis equi foideret calcaribus armos, and so it says. Not anybody. Face to face, obvious means right there. So not anybody, face to face, had brought himself to that guy armed without punishment. So in other words, nobody stepped to Marcellus without dealing with the consequences. If you were on the battlefield and you stepped to Marcellus, Marcellus would cut you down. Not anybody, face to face, had brought themselves to that guy Marcellus armed with impunity, without punishment. Pardon me, should you have Kimberly Wrangle? I do. Will you send her for checkout? Okay. Whether he was going against the enemy as a foot soldier, so whether when he was going against the enemy as a foot soldier, or whether he was digging the flanks, that would be the armos, it doesn't look like the arms, weapons, but it's not, of a foaming horse with spurs. So it doesn't matter whether he is on foot as an infantryman, it doesn't matter whether he is on a horse as a cavalryman. He is the absolute total package. Alas, boy about to be pitied. If the harsh fates, and it's the object, so if you should, rumpo rumpere with an A, as we fear a giant liar, if you should burst the harsh fates, See Nisi Numine, all the Ali's fall away in any way. If only you could just escape your fate. And this is the moment that Octavia, Augustus' sister, the mother of Marcellus, while Virgil is singing to them, passes out when it is said, You will be 
Marcellus. Because remember, for Virgil, or really for Aeneas and Anchises, Marcellus is not yet to be born. But there in front of them in the underworld, they are knowing his full story ahead of time. He will be born. He will turn into one of the greatest human beings the Romans could ever hope for, and be a leader, and be snatched away back into the underworld before his 20th birthday. You will be Marcellus. And so he then goes on to say, does Anchises, Date, go dare de date, grant it, give it, that. And so what we have here is a uh, ut indirect command, because that's your commanding word. Grant it that I spargam. Spargo, spargare, spersi, sparsus. It means to scatter. That's where we get the word sparse, disperse. So granted that I scatter, we fear a giant liar. The lilies with full hands, these are funeral ceremonies that we are talking about. So granted that I scatter lilies with full hands, those purple flowers, that's merely in apposition, in a positive, renaming what those lilies are. And granted that at least I gather up, accumulate, the spirit of the grandson, accusative, genitive, with these gifts, more ceremonial things that you do for the dead in the ancient Roman world, and grant it, so you have the first subjunctive, you have the second subjunctive, and now the third subjunctive, and this subjunctive is different because it is one of those. Deponent verbs, fungor, fungi, Functus sum, it means to carry out or perform, and granted that I perform this inane service, this pointless service. And of course, what makes the po service pointless, what makes these ceremonies and rituals pointless, is that they don't do anything. They don't bring the dead back to life. So he wants to scatter the flowers, he wants to gather up the spirit with these gifts, and he wants to perform a pointless service in the ablative because this is one of those four or five verbs, five dupont verbs, that take an ablative object. And so this moment passes, and so now again, back to the mission. Seek in such a way everywhere they wander. It is dupont verb wagor wagare, like a vagrant. They wander. And they wander in the whole region, so they're going around all around in the underworld, in the wide fields, latus aum means wide, it's where we get the word latitude. And again, a campus is a field, in the wide fields of the air, the underworld air, and they scan, lustra lustrare. Now you can either scan with your eyes, or you can scan with your feet. They're doing both. And they scan all things. And after, and Pisces, has led, perfect tense, duco ducade, has led his son through every single thing, through the individual things, in other words, he's going over every detail. And every time I read this part right here, I'm reminded of the scene of the Godfather, in which uh, the Godfather, Vito Corleone, is going over with his son Michael, who's clearly the successor to the Mafia Empire, details about probably what all of the dominoes that are going to fall upon Vito's death. And he apologizes to Michael and saying, I know I've gone over with all these things before, but I just, you gotta, you got to make sure that you have every single thing straight because otherwise all the other mafia families are going to come at you because they are going to think you weak with me now dead. And that's exactly what Anchises is doing. He's going over every single detail, and that's why it's per singula quai. And so after Anchises has led his son, his masculine thing, having been born from the verb nascor nasci, not assume it's a substantive, through individual things, and he sets on fire his mind, he inflames his mind with a love of coming fame. He gets all excited because you're going to be Aeneas. People are going to be singing about you thousands of years from now, which we are. Moreover, exim, furthermore, exim, he calls to mind, memoro, meaning make somebody else remember. Moreover, he calls to mind the wars for the man, 
the wars which then Gerenda sunt must be waged. Remember, Aeneas thinks that the bad times are behind him, but no, 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 the bad times are in front of him. I use this example. We've been in this pandemic for a year. India right now is like this. India thought, oh, yes, well, it wasn't that bad, but all of a sudden it just has exploded. And so, thereupon he calls to mind for the man, his son, the wars which then must be fought, must be waged. And he teaches about the Laurentian populations, the people he's going to find in Latium. And he teaches him the city of Latinus, the king of Latium, Latinus. And he teaches, by with because of from in on at, which method and what labor he should flee subjunctively and he should endure. In other words, this is the hill to die on, this is the hill to run away from. And so again, he teaches the Laurentian peoples, the city of Latinus, and he teaches what labor and in what way, ablative, manner, he should flee and he should endure. Then at the very end, we have the exit from the underworld through the two gates. And quite frankly, a lot of what is explained here, we still do not exactly understand the significance. It could just be that we're not a part of the culture and we're not automatically getting stuff as to why he goes out one gate versus another gate and why they're made out of what they're made out of. Because one is made of ivory and the other was made out of actual keratin, horn. There are twin gates of sleep. Altera, altera, one another. So there are twin gates of sleep. One of which is said, remember that the word pharaoh, fairy, tillilatus can mean to say, and here it is going to mean that. One of which is said, where or by which an easy exit is given to dative true shades. So one of these, if you're a real true ghost, you get to leave out of it, presumably to go and haunt someone. The other one, having been made shining, so present active participle, nitor, niti, so the other one, having been made, fuck you, fuck you, thank you, fuck you, shining with cadenti, shining elephant, that means ivory. So the other one, having been made shining with bright white ivory, but the mane. These are the ghosts, the spirits of the underworld. They are often malevolent. But the ghosts, the spirits, they send false dreams to the sky. So presumably to this other one, this ivory gate, that is the gate that obviously sends out nightmares. That's what it means by false dreams. Both nightmares and, obviously, dreams which are misleading. We're about to finish here. And there it is. There then, so you have two gates, and one is made of ivory. There then, Anchises follows, sequor sequi sequitisum, the masculine thing having been born, his son, and together, una, with a long A and a long U means together, the Sibyl. So Anchises follows his son, and together he follows the Sibyl, his dictis, with these words, and he sends them from the ivory gate. And so why he goes out the ivory gate, the one that the manes, the ghosts, send out the false dreams, nobody knows. But it did say that the other gate is the one that was the easy exit for the real ghosts, the real shades. So maybe that is the reason, but we do not know. So he sends him out the ivory gate. And then that guy, meeting Aeneas now, he cuts the road, seco secare, to the shifts, and he revisits his buddies. That's it.